Hi and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly show where you guys get to ask us some mountain bike related technical questions and hopefully we can give you some answers. Get your questions in on the screen right there is the email address and at the bottom you can add yours in the comments. Don't forget to use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech just to make us spot your questions. So first up this week is from Angus Hazelton. Hi guys, I have an Alloy Giant Trance 2017 model with 140mm travel out back, 150 in the front, and I like riding enduro and downhill. Would I be able to put a 170mm fork on it and an angled headset to slack in it? If so, what effects would this have on the bike? Is 140 and 170 too big a difference, or should I just buy an enduro bike? Okay, well first up, let's just look at the fork travel. So jumping up 20 mil more up the front there to 170, that's a significant amount, especially like you say, when you've got 140 out the back. Now, I probably wouldn't go any more than 10 mil extra. You do see some bikes at 140, 160, that works quite well. But something you have to factor in is the longer fork travel you go, the higher your head tube will be. So it will slightly slacken a head angle, but it will also slacken your seat angle which means your bike won't be quite so good at climbing and it will bump your bottom bracket off the deck a little bit, which means it'll be a little bit more unstable. We're talking small amounts here, but they will be significant in the way that the bike handles if you know your bike really well. Now that slack seat angle, what that basically means is your saddle will be further towards the rear axle of the bike. So when you're climbing, it's gonna be easier for it to do a wheelie. So you have to compensate by putting the saddle forward slightly and tipping the nose down. Now, I probably wouldn't suggest going for 170 because it's probably just going to be too much leverage on the head tube of the bike with it being that long, and I'm sure that the manufacturer will say that as well. Now, with respect to slackening it off, personally, I would rather keep the 150 mil with the 140 out back and then just put an angled headset in there and enjoy the feeling of it being slacker and more aggressive. Now, by doing this, it will steepen your seat tube slightly because you do, as the fork slackens out, the frame will drop very slightly and you'll also lower that bottom bracket. You'll get a slightly more aggressive feeling front end of the bike, and that fork will work slightly better the faster you hit stuff, just because of the angle it's gonna to be towards the, the bumps it's gonna be absorbing. Now, by putting it up to 160 and slackening the bike out, let's just say one and a half degrees, you're probably gonna find it's not gonna be that much higher at the front end, so your geometry is gonna be fairly similar, except for the fact you're gonna have a slightly slacker head angle, which is, by the sounds of it, what you want. But like I said, you do have to factor in that additional leverage that this can put on your head tube. I've done this in the past, and I was told, this particular bike I did it to was a Trek, I was told by Trek that it voided the warranty. But I was happy to do it and I took that chance, but I'm not suggesting you do, that is entirely up to you. And I would definitely check on your warranty first, because if you're gonna be using an all mountain bike like that, and you're suggesting we use it for Enduro and downhill, you're gonna be riding it pretty hard anyway, and probably on the limit of what a warranty would let you get away with. So just factor that in when you make your decision. But there you go. I would say maybe go up 10 mil or put an angle set in that, but I probably wouldn't do both. Uh, next up is suspension related from the d Hi Dolly, I've got a question about suspension tuning. For now, on my trail bike is a RockShox Sector RL with the Solo Air Spring. I really want to tune it up for a little bit more mid support and progression. In modern forks like the Pike, you can use tokens. How can I do the same job with this old Solo Air? Now, unfortunately, I think the fork you've got is the same one that's on my Nupri Scout, and I wanted to do exactly the same. I just haven't got round to it yet. Um, I blame that on still building my own bike cave, but we'll get to that in another episode of the show. Now, the problem you have, if it is the same model that I'm thinking of, is it doesn't have a threaded top cap, and the air tube unit on the inside it's very different, so you can't use the regular bottomless tokens that you get for RockShox, so like a Revelation or the Lyric or the Pike. Um, you can't just fit a threaded top cap either because of that internal tube. And the old school way of doing it would be put, to put some oil inside that air tube itself, just where the, the air chamber, if you like, and that would sort of reduce that air volume by the amount of volume you're taking up with oil, i.e. doing the same job. You can't do that on that fork because of the way the negative spring works, because the ports between them like equalizers, it will actually suck that oil between them. So that's not gonna work either. Now the solution, which again, I did mean to get around to doing it, I just haven't, is to make some spaces myself that can push fit into that top cap. Now you could do that, of course, you have to make sure they don't come out of that top cap and you have to make sure they're similar sort of size to the regular RockShox ones. I think that's pretty much your only way of doing it. 
because on my screen at the moment, I'm looking at a picture of the brand new sector, which is compatible now with, they've obviously updated the fork, it's compatible with bottomless tokens, and there's a link to the site there where it actually states that. So unless you want to do it yourself, I think you might be stuck with it as it is. Okay, next up is from AA. I've just replaced my eight speed chain from KMC to Shimano. When I pedal hard on the fourth gear sprocket, also a Shimano cassette, the chain is slipping a lot as if it doesn't want to bite into the cassette. Any help? Um, well, firstly, it's kind of hard without a picture of your cassette to actually see what the sort of damage is. But especially with older cassettes, we're talking like seven, eight, nine speeds, and sometimes even 10, the cassette and the chain do wear at a similar rate. And if you do ride with the worn chain, you're gonna wear on a cassette pretty fast. So the key is to replace the chain before it's worn in order to get more life out of the cassette. Now, something else to bear in mind, you say four sprocket, do I assume that's fourth from the bottom? Um, if so, then that's probably one of the gears that you use the most, in which case you've just got that sprocket is worn. Now, I don't think in your case, you're gonna be able to replace that individual sprocket. I think it's time for a new cassette. Um, maybe you should send a picture to me of your cassette so we can just try and identify that a little bit further. Alternatively, if you have a look on screen now, there's a picture of what a cassette should look like when it's new. And if yours looks any different to that on that fourth sprocket, you should be able to identify the fact that it is unfortunately worn and time for a new one. Next up from, I think I'm saying this right, Guy and Carlos Selenga. I like the show because it's informative and interesting, but I need some help. I have an old hardtail that has Alex rims, TD26 and their 26 inch rims. I've been thinking of going tubeless due to the punctures I'm getting quite often. I'm not sure if my rims are tubeless ready and if I can turn it tubeless. Thanks for the response. Okay, so technically you can make any rim tubeless, but before you do that, you need to consider that you will need some tubeless ready tires. Now, most modern tires, even in 26 inch, will be tubeless ready today, so I'll definitely suggest getting a set of those. You can set up none tubeless ready tires, but you will potentially waste a lot of sealant doing it because the sealant will come through that carcass until it's completely coated the inside and made sort of like an inner skin. So I'll definitely consider looking at the tire option first. Now, any rim can be made tubeless ready simply by getting a tubeless ready conversion kit. So stands make those, so it's a rubber rim strip with the valves built on. Alternatively, you can just buy the valves and get some Gorilla Tape, run the Gorilla Tape around the inside of your rim so it seals off the rim bed where the nipples poke through, and then simply put the valve straight into there and then you've got a tubeless ready system. Now, of course, you do need to select the right tire sealant for where you're gonna ride. If you're riding somewhere really hot, the solutions that have got a bit more latex and they do work excellently, like the Stans one, the Continental, there's a whole bunch of them out there. But you do have to bear in mind that the more latexy they are, the faster they tend to dry up in those hot conditions. So you need to keep topping up from time to time. There's a number that aren't that sort of basis out on the market, just like the finish line, for example, that does tend to stay that lasts a bit longer, but that's not so good for using in a non-tubeless ready tire. That's better in a tubeless tire. So there are a few things there. So I'm just gonna throw you to my tubeless mistakes video because there's a few little setup tips in there just to help you get your tires set up tubeless. The thing that people make with tubeless setup is not doing a dry run first. So there's a lot of reasons to do that. Firstly, you get to find out if the bond between your tire and your rim is good, and you can change that afterwards. Secondly, you're not wasting tire sealant on the floor by spraying it everywhere. Okay, we've got a question, interesting one actually, about oval chain rings. Blood Runner asks, what is the benefit of having an oval chain ring? Okay, so I think the best way to think about oval chain rings is that they kind of balance out the way your power transfer gets through to that rear wheel. Now, if we just use flat pedals for the example here, when you're put pushing down on a pedal, that's let's just call that the hot spot, and the, the upstroke, basically the, the part of the pedal stroke when you're not doing anything, let's call that a cold spot. So in a pedaling circle, if you look at it in the diagram, the hot spot is gonna have quite a lot and the cold spot is gonna be nothing going on there. Now the idea of an overlies chain ring is to maximize on that hot spot and minimize on that cold spot basically. So you're just getting a better power transfer down. Now one of the advantages of that are, again, if we use flat pedals as an example here, if you've got a round chain ring and an oval chain ring, with the round chain ring, if you're pedaling up something quite steep and you're really stabbing on those pedals, it's quite erratic the way that you put the power through to the wheel. And you can wheel spin, which is not good on a mountain bike, especially if you're on, say, loose gravel or wet routes or anything like that. 
with that overlaced chainmail, it's going to help sort of reduce that stabbing motion. Instead of your pedaling being like this, it's going to be a smoother sort of action. So essentially, it is to help smooth out your pedaling stroke. Now, something, I mean, I've not spent a lot of time on them. I have ridden them, and I can tell you it definitely does work, but I definitely do need to spend more time and do a back-to-back -back video, I think, to show some specific examples. But something that was particularly interesting to me is at that first World Cup, the XC round we went to in South Africa, almost all of the riders' bikes we checked out had overlaced chain rings on it. Now, that's quite surprising to me because you're talking about like the elite riders, the best of the best. These people just train all day long to be as efficient as possible, and yet they're still using overlaced chain rings. So we will be doing a geek edition on overlaced chain rings at some point soon. We just need to do the right sort of research and we'll come back to you with that. Oh, we've got a big one here from Greg Betts from West Yorkshire. I've recently bought a brand new Vitus Sente VRS Plus hardtail. Nice bike, I was looking at those the other day. Um, I've made a few small modifications, but no, uh, but nothing major yet. I've fitted an enduro mudguard, orange cable crimps, bought some orange cable ties. I know how you love cable ties, certainly do. Um, and I'm waiting on delivery of my orange HT flat pedals. like it, you're doing a bit of a colour coding thing here. Also got myself a toolbox for my spare parts, bike cleaner, brushes, etc. But I've got some questions you might be able to help me with about my new bike. First up, I'm considering buying some Hope jockey wheels. Um, as a modification just for aesthetic purposes. Will this affect the performance of the bike? Do you think it's a good investment? Um, well, there's no doubt that aluminium, like the ones you can see on screen now, aluminium jockey wheels will last longer because there's a harder material than the plastic that you see or nylon that you normally see on jockey wheels. That's great. They've also got bearings in them, which again can last longer than the bushings you get on some. Of course, not all standard jockey wheels have bushings. Some do have bearings in them, but generally, Jockey wheels are seen as a bit more of a disposable item, so by putting something like the Hope ones on there, I'm sure you're going to get a lot more use out of them. So yeah, why not? They look cool as well, so that's a cool one to, to go for. Uh, number two, secondly, my bike was delivered with a large chip in the head tube. It was actually the last bike of my size and stock, so they couldn't replace it, unfortunately. The chip is only cosmetic, but it is quite deep. How should I attempt to fix it? Um, I have some touch-up paint that was supplied with the bike. Okay, so you've got the touch-up paint. Um, just for other viewers out there, if you haven't got any touch-up paint, the first point of call should always be the manufacturer or the distributor of your bike because they should be able to supply you with some paint that will definitely match your paintwork. If not, there's two other options there for trying to get a good, well, actually three options for trying to match that paint. Now, the cheapest option is probably go to your local DIY shop with a photograph of a close-up of the paint finish on your bike and just tell them that you're looking for a paint sample to match that because you want to, I don't know, colour code it with your workshop or something. And they should be able to mix up some paint that looks very, very close, if not identical, to yours. Now, they're either free or they're very cheap, they're samples, and you can use that to fill in that and then cover it over with some sort of epoxy or nail varnish and then rub it dry with or rub it smooth even with some wet and dry. Now the other option is to go to a model shop. In particular, look for paints by brands like Tamiya, who specialize in radio controlled cars and models like boats and stuff. They've got huge ranges of enamel and acrylic paints, and you're pretty much gonna be able to get a, an absolute match there with one of them, I'd have thought, because there's so many paints available. The final option, of course, is to go to a car sprayers. They're certainly gonna be able to help match that paint for you. But of course, they're all expensive, so first point of call is to speak to your bike shop, stroke distributor, stroke the bike company that make that bike, because they should always be able to help. Now, to get that chip filled in, what you're gonna need is some very fine wet and dry paper. Um, and some clear sort of resin to put over the top. I'd say some clear nail varnish is a good shout for that because it's dirt cheap and you can easily apply it. So what you're looking to do really is sand the area around the chip there and what you're looking to do there is just to make sure there's not any rough edges basically to ruin the finish. Don't go too far because you don't want to actually sort of dole down the paint around it. Then clean that off, fill it in with that paint, wait for it to dry completely. If necessary, use a bit of wet and dry just to file it level again before painting on some clear nail varnish or any sort of clear coat over the top of that to act as a kind of top coat, basically. Then you can polish that down again with the wet and dry and then clean and buff it up and hopefully you'll have a pretty good finish on that. Okay, and the last question says, finally, I'm having some problems with the drivetrain. When in the lowest gear, so the biggest sprocket, the chain does not align well with the front crank set. It seems to be stretching a lot from left to right and is slipping on some of the chaining teeth. 
Pedaling forwards makes a loud noise, it definitely should not. And when I pedal backwards, ever so slightly, the chain jumps back off onto the second largest sprocket because the chain is being pulled to the right by the crank set. How do I solve this? The only thing I can think of is remove the spacer between the chain ring and the bottom bracket so it sits more aligned with the largest sprocket. Adjusting limit screws are not fixing the issue. Okay, so it sounds to me that you've got a bit of a chain line issue there. So depending on the orientation, the way yours has been put together, you might find that there's a spacer between the bottom bracket and the frame. If so, that probably wants to be on the other side of the frame, moving your whole chain ring into the bike. Now, so with a regular bottom bracket, what you're looking for to get the correct chain line is 48 to 50 millimeters. That is between the chain ring and the middle of the bottom bracket. Now with your bike, which is Boost, it should be 51 to 53 millimeters. So you can take a measurement yourself and you can see if you're outside that. If, if so, that's what you've got to do. You basically got to get the whole crank set slightly inboard on the bike. Chain line is really important, especially on one by systems where the chain has to move so much. A, for getting clean shifting, and B, because you don't want to wear stuff out prematurely. So just make sure you have a look at yours, make that measurement, and if yours does fall between that 51 and 53 mil, then you're good. If it's the other way around, then of course you're going to need to sort of alter that slightly. On the screen right now is a page from the One Up Components website, and they've got a real useful sort of information, frequently asked questions type thing on chain lines. And this tells you a lot of things, and you can actually sort of work your way through the process to identify the particular problem that you have and actually see it. So if what I've told you doesn't help, have a look at that page because it will definitely help you find the key to your problem. So if it is the case of yours and it does need adjusting, it's entirely possible that when your bike was assembled, because it would have been assembled by hand, um, that literally that space has just made it onto the wrong side of the bottom bracket or something small like that. A bit annoying, I'm sure, but it's only human error. We're all human. There we go, another GMBN Tech Clinic in the bag there. Hopefully answered some of your questions. If you've got any questions, fire away in those comments or get them into the address that was at the beginning of the show. That is hellotech at gmbn.com. Don't forget to put Ask GMBN Tech in the subject field, just so we know what to look for, basically. For a couple more great videos, click down here for the Geek Edition on what pedal is fastest for Enduro. That's where Neil's taking a proper look, for him certainly, what is fastest out of clips or flats. Quite a critical video, that one. And if you want to see something a bit more lighthearted and see me act on the clown, click down here for some really, really last Last resort, I'd say, trail side hacks. Hopefully, some of those will get you out of bad times out on the trail. As always, click on that globe to subscribe, share it around, tell all your mates about us, and if you like this video or we've managed to answer some of your questions, give us a thumbs up.